multivariable and vector calculus. Part 6. Generalize Stokes' Theorem and Differential Forms With Vector the Vector Ferry Baby Vector Y Baby Vector This presentation is a review of vector calculus by introducing the idea of generalized Stokes' theorem and differential forms rather than really learning those topics. Thus, this is a very basic early baby introduction. Greek symbols omega, boundary omega, d omega, Also note that we'll use the typesetting dx rather than notation that might look like a single term or that might be too similar. The goal is to show that d is a differentiation operator applied to functions. So dx would be the differentiation operator applied to f of x equals x. Usually, all our integrals will be in the form of integral, where context will tell if it's a single integral, double integral, or triple integral. Notes will be labeled as n1, n2, recall that points are zero-dimensional, curves are one-dimensional, surfaces are two-dimensional, and volumes are three-dimensional. A 1D integral computes the 2D area. A 2D integral computes the 3D volume. A 3D integral computes the 4D hypervolume. A 0D integral computes the 1D length. Technically, all the boundaries have to be oriented, smooth, and so on, but all the visuals will be rectangular-ish. The vector field assigns a tangent vector to every point of the domain. All the functions contain the appropriate amount of variables and are differentiable. Recall that flow is tangential to a curve and flux is perpendicular to a curve. Let's review the geometric properties of dot product, determinant, and cross product. Dot product The dot product measures how much a pair of vectors are parallel or collinear. If they're in the same direction, then the dot product is positive, if perpendicular, then zero, if opposite, then negative. Determinant The determinant gives the signed area of the parallelogram. That is, if the vectors are switched, then the number becomes its negative. The sign for the area is with respect to the orientation of the coordinate axes. Cross product. The cross product is perpendicular to both A and B, and its direction is given by the right-hand rule. Thus, switching A and B directs the cross product in the opposite direction. Note that when the dot product is zero, the cross product 
is maximum. Geometrically, when theta equals zero, the parallelogram is flat. Let's review the concepts of gradient, divergence, and curl. Gradient grind, divergence dust, rotation wheel. Let's review some operations that are done to vectors. Gradient grind, There is a scalar function that has two variables, x and y. If we travel on the graph of f starting at p and always moving in the direction pointed by the gradient, then we would cover the path shown by the black line. It would be the path of steepest ascent. Gradient f also contains all the directional derivatives of f by taking dot products and is perpendicular to the level sets of f at each point. Divergence dust. When divergence is positive, the dust will expand. When divergence is negative, the dust will contract. This means that the vectors and their increase has to be in alignment, and so dot product is used. Divergence is maximized in absolute value at a source or sink. Rotation wheel. Counterclockwise spin at a point is positive curl. For this to happen, p's would go from positive to negative as y increases. Likewise, q's would go from negative to positive as x increases. Perpendicularity between vectors creates spin and so cross product is used. Now, let's review some k-dimensional manifolds. For this presentation, a manifold is a space that is locally flat if we zoom in enough. The dimension k is how many coordinates describe a point on that manifold. For the manifolds, their domains are blue, and their boundaries are red. For a k-dimensional manifold, the boundary is a k-1-dimensional manifold. What is the domain and boundary of the fundamental theorem of calculus? the domain and boundary of the fundamental theorem of calculus. What is the domain and boundary of the fundamental theorem of line integrals? The domain and boundary of the fundamental theorem of line integrals. What is the domain and boundary of Green's theorem? The domain and boundary of Green's theorem. What is the domain and boundary of Stokes's theorem? The domain and boundary of Stokes's theorem. What is the domain and boundary of divergence theorem?
the domain and boundary of divergence theorem. What is the domain of length? The domain of length. Although there are small changes in the domain, some changes will cancel each other out. So, the sum of the small changes on the inside will equal the overall change on the outside. Both the fundamental theorem of calculus and the fundamental theorem of line integrals involve intervals and gradients. Both Green's theorem and Stokes' theorem involve areas and curls. The divergence theorem involves volumes and flux through the surface. As mentioned, the sum of the small changes on the inside will equal the overall change on the outside. To get these small changes, Consider if we cut up our domains into subintervals, subareas, and subvolumes. This would give us mini gradients, mini curls, and mini fluxes on those various subdomains. If we add them up, then we'd get the overall change on the outside. But how should we cut? How did we first cut when we learned about integration? We used Riemann's sums, and the result was discrete and approximating. Thinking back to the topics we've learned, in what other way were the cuts discrete and approximating? Firstly, if we think of differential form as a form based upon differentials, then we should consider differentials. We have seen them in linear approximations for single variable functions and planar approximations for two variable functions. In this way, we can describe a curve using only straight lines, tangents. Here is a picture. For single variable functions and tangent lines, we have independent variable for how much x changes. Dependent variable for how much the tangent line rises or falls. For two variable functions in tangent planes, we have independent variables for how much x and y changes. Total differential for how much the tangent plane rises or falls. Note that the differentials are similar to what is to the right of the integral signs of Fundamental Theorem of Calculus and Green's Theorem. we're going to call the functions omega and the differentials d omega. Now, let's review the fundamental theorem of calculus and then the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Note the rewriting of the sum. Notations from before. Let the function omega be over the boundary. And so our integral becomes... Although the notations seem magical, we have defined the functions and differential first. It just so happens that they were hidden in the fundamental theorem of calculus.
We're going to call the omega a zero form since it has no differentials. And we're going to call d omega a one form since it has differential. Note the rewriting of the sum. Notations from before. with a scalar function f of x, y, and so on. Let the function omega be over the boundary. We have this. Since Calculations and calculations and more calculations. And so our integral becomes again. Although the notations seem magical, we had defined the functions and differential first. It just so happens that they were hidden in the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Also again, we're going to call the omega a zero form since it has no differentials. And we're going to call d omega a one form since it is a sum of differentials dx and dy. What is the domain, boundary, function, and derivative for the fundamental theorem of calculus? The domain, boundary, function, and derivative of fundamental theorem of calculus. The domain, boundary, function, and derivative of the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Functions omega, zero forms. Derivatives d omega, one forms. Summarizing, we had this. Note that if we think in terms of k-forms, when k equals zero, then d of a k-form omega is the k plus one form d omega. Let's look at the relationship between df and gradient f. Both contain all the information about the directional derivatives of f. If we input one vector into these one forms, we get an output of a scalar. Although the term differential form field isn't used, we could think of a differential form on a manifold since it gives a particular differential form at a point. So, to get the directional derivative of f in the direction of v at a point x, we input the vector v into df and evaluate at x. So, to get the directional derivative of f in the direction of v at a point x, we input the vector v into gradient f and use the dot product. Overall, if we have a one-form omega that we want to integrate over a curve C, then we input tangent vectors at each point into omega. This gives us a one-dimensional integral. With this in mind, perhaps we could extrapolate. For two forms omega, 
that we want to integrate over a surface S, then we input tangent planes at each point into omega. With differential forms, we have a consistent language for describing geometry. Without differential forms, we would have different symbols. In whatever dimension, differential forms exist on manifolds, input tangent vectors, and output scalars. Eventually, we'll see that we'll only need one operator and one theorem, the exterior derivative and the generalized Stokes' theorem. Returning back to our approximations and using fundamental theorem of calculus due to simplicity, what did our zero form and one forms do? Here is a picture. The zero form gave us a starting point in space, and then the one form gave us discrete increases along that path. As we traveled along that path, we added up those one form values. Once we had finished the path, we had the total change and had returned to a zero form. The fundamental theorem of line integrals had a winding path that had both dx's and dy's, and so we had to consider increases in both one forms. More precisely, we needed the derivative of f in the direction tangent to c. Our two previous theorems had differentials on only one side of the equation. But with our remaining theorems, we have differentials on both sides of the equation, and so our omega not only contains differentials, but also differentials together. Green's theorem, Stokes' theorem, Divergence theorem. So, we need something new. Considering the geometry of differential forms for the first two theorems, it seems that we need something two-dimensional, like a parallelogram, for Green's theorem and Stokes' theorem, and something three-dimensional, like a parallelepiped, for a divergence theorem. To analyze the higher dimensional integrals, we need the wedge product. Rather than a list of properties and their proofs, we'll see them in the computations. The most important properties to us that are not intuitive. Anti-commutivity due to the arrangement of vectors. Due to anti-commutivity, dx wedge dx equals zero because a number equals its negative. Thus, in 3D, four forms would be zero since one of the differentials would repeat and this becomes zero. We could remove the wedges to get k-dimensional volume elements. Note that dA equals this, and dV equals this. On the next slide, we'll see that determinants measure volumes due to how they have similar properties. Given k vectors, we can create a k-dimensional parallelepiped. If we project this parallelepiped upon a space made by k-coordinates, we get a parallelepiped with a projected k-volume. 
A K form measures the K volume of this K dimensional parallelepiped that has been projected. Replacing vectors. One way to measure this k volume is by determinants, though there might be a positive minus sign difference, and these determinants give a scalar which could be integrated by adding them up. Extracting components. The more alignment between the vectors and the projection, the greater the value. Thus, a k-form converts k-vectors into a scalar by giving a unified approach to measuring k-dimensional volume, length, area, volume, etc. Note that this, evaluated on a vector, gives the component of signed k-dimensional volume of the k-parallelogram spanned by this vector. A k-form takes k-vectors to measure the k-dimensional volume element and gives a scalar. These scalars could be integrated over an oriented domain. Below, the one-forms are represented as stacks and give numbers that then could be added up. or vacuumed up. A manifold is a k-dimensional object in n-dimensional space. In three-dimensional space, note that k is greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to n, which equals three. Note that k forms for k greater than n will be zero due to the repetition of a differential in the wedge product. For an integral over a k dimensional manifold, the k form is what comes after the integral sign as a linear combination of k forms of the same k. In this way, a function omega is a k form when it has k many differentials together in a wedge product. For below, functions f, g, and h are variables x, y, and z. k, manifold, integrals, note the order of differentials, what the k form gives. lines, length, normal vectors of flux. Parallelogram, area, filling tubes of flux. Parallelepiped, volume, having boxes of flux. Point, evaluation at a level surface. To introduce the idea of the exterior derivative, recall this from our work on omega and d omega from the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus and Fundamental Theorem of Line Integrals. Zero forms and one forms Exterior derivatives, zero form, one form. K form in Rn, where k is greater than zero. K plus one form in Rn. For this presentation, we don't really need to know these details, since the results of the calculations are already done. Now that we've been introduced to wedge product, k-forms, and exterior derivative, let's return to the equations that have differentials on both sides.
like before, we let our functions omega be part of the integral over the boundary, and we see where our calculations take us. Green's theorem, Stokes's theorem, Divergence theorem. Now, let's look at Green's theorem. Like before, we let the function equal omega as that is over the boundary. Since Green's theorem is for a two-dimensional surface, omega only needs components with dx and dy. Green's theorem Notations from before one form, and let the function omega be over the boundary. d omega should be a two form. Calculations. Note one and two. And note that dA equals dx wedge dy. The differential of this one form relates to co. And so our integral becomes domain boundary k function derivative of fundamental theorem of calculus, fundamental theorem of line integrals, and Green's theorem. Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, Fundamental Theorem of Line Integrals, Green's Theorem. K forms, K plus one forms. Summarizing, we have now let's look at Stokes's theorem. Like before, we let the function equal omega as that is over the boundary. Unlike Green's theorem for two dimensional surfaces, Stokes's theorem is for a three dimensional surface, and so omega needs components with dx and dy and dz. Stokes's theorem. Notations from before. Omega is a one form. We'll find d omega below. A two form is expected. Calculations. Note 1 and Note 2. Next, we'll factor and rearrange. Note 2, change the sign of the coefficient. Like with Green's theorem, the differential of this one form relates to curl. That is, the coefficients of d omega are the components of curl. Where curl n is the nth component of curl. Curl To replace the wedge products of dx, dy, and dz, if r u v parameterizes the surface S, then the wedge products would be du wedge dv, where x, y, and z. Since the wedge products in d omega give areas, these Jacobian determinants will find the scaling factor when going from uv to 
x, y, z. To get a normal vector of uv parallelograms, determinants of 2 by 2 matrices were placed by Jacobians. Our surface area elements can be given by n uv du wedge dv, and this expresses d omega in terms of du wedge dv. d omega. Factor out du wedge dv. Dot product between curl and n. Let ds equal n uv du wedge dv. Stokes' theorem. Notations. And so our integral becomes domain boundary k function derivative for fundamental theorem of calculus for fundamental theorem of line integrals for Green's theorem for Stokes's theorem K forms K plus one forms Summarizing we have Lastly Let's look at Divergence Theorem. We'll let the function equal omega as that is over the boundary. Divergence Theorem Notations from before We'll find d omega below and a 3 form is expected. Calculations Note 1 and Note 2 After simplifying and factoring The coefficient of dx wedge dy wedge dz is the divergence of f Since dx wedge dy wedge dz is parallelepiped dv. Divergence theorem Notations And so our integral becomes Boundary, domain, k, function, derivative. Fundamental theorem of calculus. Fundamental theorem of line integrals. Green's theorem. Stokes' theorem Divergence theorem K forms, K plus 1 forms Summarizing, we have Although there are small changes in the domain, 
Some changes will cancel each other out. So the sum of the small changes on the inside will equal the overall change on the outside. On the next slide, we'll see vectors local and global properties. Note that our three vector differential operators, gradient, curl, and divergence, can be interpreted as differentials on forms. Here is a diagram. A scalar field is a function that gives numbers to points in space, and a vector field is a function that assigns vectors to points in space. Also note that when a field is differentiated twice, the result is zero. So, gradient fields are curl-free, and curl fields are divergence-free. The integral of d omega over the domain is equal to the integral of omega over the boundary. We could shrink the domain down to a point and measure infinitesimal quantities. For fundamental theorem of line integrals, the gradient is measuring infinitesimal increase. For Stokes's theorem, the curl is measuring infinitesimal vorticity, spin. For divergence theorem, the divergence is measuring infinitesimal flux. Now, let's look at work forms, flux forms, as well as density forms for comparison and or completion. If F is thought of as a force acting, and U is the displacement vector, then the work done by F is given by the dot product. If F is thought of as a fluid flowing through a surface, then that flux equals volume of parallel pipette. The density is the mass per unit volume, and so we can integrate it to find total mass. On the next slide, we'll see the work form and the flux form. Differential form omega, zero form function, one form work, two form flux, three form density. In Cartesian coordinates, work, flux, density, exterior derivative, d omega, derivative of function, derivative of work, derivative of flux, the components and their coefficients. work components with gradient coefficients, flux components with 
curl coefficients. Density components with divergence coefficients. And derivative of density is zero. Relating this to the forms in Cartesian coordinates, the coefficients are based upon the vector differential operators. Generalize Stokes' theorem. The integral of d omega over the domain equals the integral of omega over the boundary. Domain omega is a k plus 1 dimensional manifold. Boundary omega is boundary of the manifold. Omega is a k form with k equaling 0, 1, or 2. d omega is the exterior derivative of the differential form omega. k, 0, 1, 2. Here is the generalized Stokes theorem. When k equals 0, we have fundamental theorem of calculus and fundamental theorem of line integrals. When k equals 1, we have Green's and Stokes' theorem. When k equals 2, we have divergence theorem. That was multivariable and vector calculus. Part 6, generalize Stokes' theorem and differential forms. With vector, the vector ferry. Thank you for watching.